Hey everyone. Hey guys, this is Rita. This is Amanda. You're listening to I Don't, I know, don't know Her. The podcast where you talk about women you've probably never heard of. But you should have. And now you will. Mm-hmm. I <laughs> Uh, Rita was just talking about how their (laughs) family is trying an experiment. Yeah, so here's, uh, don't ever leave the Netflix on when you're asleep, because my son watched a documentary, (laughs) and it was about about, uh, meat processing in the world, you know, and he all of a sudden was like, you know, meat's really bad for you. He's like, it gets into your arteries and it clogs your clogs your arteries, which affects your heart and it makes you not very healthy and it's actually not sustainable because there's too many humans and then they process (laughs) too much meat in bad ways. And so he he got very, very, uh, I don't know, lit about it. So he was like, I want to try to go vegetarian. And if he does something, he's very much all of us have to do it. And I try to be supportive. (laughs) So I was like, okay. I was like, we'll we'll go vegetarian and we'll do it for a week. And so I did... um, I do the grocery shopping, so I did the grocery shopping on a Sunday and made a plan for all the meals for all of this week, and it's been going good. You know, he likes it. He said he felt a little tired, so we've been experimenting with, like, different proteins from different places, Um, but my husband had a dream about uh, Costco beef hot dogs last (laughs) night. (laughs) He was like, I I just, I had a dream that I had those Costco beef hot dogs, but they were really big. (laughs) I was like, do you want some meat? <laughs> I, I I think it's hard if you're not the one making a choice to be vegetarian. It's so much harder. I think so, too. Because then you fixate slightly. Oh, for sure. Yeah. Yeah. And there we have that carne asada at work. And I was just like, oh, and I'm like looking at my black beans with guacamole. I'm like, this is sad. I don't like this. <laughs> Yeah, you can't even have the pork and the, the pinto beans because no, they're made with pork. Yeah, pork in them. Yeah. Yeah, that's funny. Well, I was a vegetarian for a year. I was actually a vegetarian for two years. Were you? Yeah. When my late teens, early 20s. Yeah, that's when I was vegetarian as well. I, I, I didn't. Okay. I'm pretty sure it was the last, like, coughs of my anorexia. Because mm. I had, um, full disclosure massive eating disorder for most of my life (laughs) and um i just would come up with like all of these reasons to not eat Mm -hmm. and when i became a freshman in college being vegetarian seemed like a great thing because i was also really into changing and i had started to get into more environmentalism stuff and i was hiking and running and i was like i should be a vegetarian obviously (laughs) So I did, but I'm from Montana. And Word. that's like a big ranching area, right? It's like, yeah, no one knew what to do with me ever anywhere I went. I would go to I would go to have like a meal at a friend's house or like at my parents' house. Mm-hmm. And they were like, what do we feed you? I was like, just <laughs> have the just meal and I won't, <laughs> I won't eat the meat. Like that's all. So then my mom would make like three extra sides. So I would just have a plate of six sides. <laughs> it was really funny and very cute. Um, but then, and actually I was a vegetarian, I think for about a year and a half. It wasn't until I was probably about halfway through my second year of college. I might even been most of the way through my second year of college. Oh, wow. And I... I had also like, again, eating disorder and we, I grew up in a town where there was no fast food. So I wasn't really, I I didn't really ever eat fast food except Mm -hmm. when we went on trips. Like if we went to a place we might, maybe if I was lucky, my mom (laughs) might allow me to get a happy meal. Whoa. (laughs) So I remember that we were at Taco Bell and I had never been to a Taco Bell before. Yikes. And my all I was with some friends and they were all eating and I was like, I think I want to try that. <laughs> and that was it. It was a taco? Yeah, yeah, I had I had Taco Bell. And also now Taco Bell is my favorite fast food. <laughs> Shout out to Taco Bell. <laughs> <laughs> well, the reason I went vegetarian is my oldest sister, um, when I was uh I was living at home and she was at home, she had moved back home uh for a brief time. She's vegetarian fully. And so 
we used to hang out a lot and she, she would do like some cooking and she spent a lot of time um, going back and forth from England and she had a lot of um, Indian friends over there and they taught her how to like cook curries and things like that. So it just kind of started, I don't know, just kind of emulating her diet and mm-hmm. then just, it just slowly meat just kind of wasn't very appealing to me anymore. And it was just, I was fine being vegetarian. And I remember the exact time that I broke though was because I had come home and I was like, had been partying with my friends and I was a little tipsy <laughs> and my mom and dad had gone to dinner and my mom always has a to-go box. She never finishes her food. She always leaves it on the counter. She never puts it in the fridge. Okay. I don't know why. <laughs> <laughs> so she left this box on the counter and I opened it up and it was a steak. Like she Ooh. hadn't, fi- and they had gone somewhere nice. So it was a really nice cut of meat. And I was like, I want that. And I just, <laughs> <laughs> and I remember eating it with my hands. It just like like a bear, just like <laughs> and that was it. It was. Did over. you get sick? I don't think so. See, I didn't get sick when I ate meat either. After had, I mean, it had been almost two years, I think, and I hadn't. I didn't get sick, but my roommate had been a vegetarian for years and years and years, and one night was like, "I'm not going to be a vegetarian anymore." <laughs> oh, it was no. very weird, and he was like. Let's go have a steak dinner. And I was like, <gasps> no, dude, you're going to get so sick. And he was like, eh, shrug. <laughs> so we go to this restaurant and he eats a steak. And he's like, you could tell he like starts to turn a little green. Uh, and I was like, oh, no. And he was sick for days. Oh, my goodness. No, Not I, because of the. It's just like it's like a, it, especially a steak. It's super rich. Yeah. It's full of fat and goodness. Mm-hmm. And I body, love meat. Not used to it. <laughs> yeah. We at least eat, we try to have at least two dinners a week that's vegetarian. One to two dinners a week. Um, we do usually do meatless Mondays. Mm-hmm. And then we usually try to have one more. Um, and I like it that way. We And we don't, we try not to eat too much of one protein, like because we are meat eaters and we know it is not necessarily good for the environment or good for anything. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, we don't really eat any red meat very often. Maybe, maybe once every other week. Yeah, I was going to say our red meat intake is not very much. Yeah, we mostly eat pork and chicken. Mm-hmm. And sometimes, occasionally, some seafood. But I don't, I don't like eating fish that's been, like, frozen. Mm-hmm. You know, it's just, it gets watery and I just don't care for it. Mm-hmm. And it's hard to get fresh cut fish when you're in the interior of a state. Yeah. We're, I mean, like, we're lucky enough to be in a state that has a coast, but... Still, it's still like a four hour drive. <laughs> yeah. Well, I think we're we're doing the one full week. So today is my last day. <laughs> I'm going to eat meat tomorrow. Um, but I think what we're going to take away from it is I think you're right. Like maybe two to three meals a, a week that we do vegetarian. I did some really fun options in his lunchbox, which he really liked. And so I'm just going to try to be more conscious of that. Like maybe not have meat every day. So is he on board with eating meat again? He, he, kinda, he said he misses it, he said, but he's he's kind of on the fence. He's like a little conflicted. I will say that it's for how active he is, how many sports he plays and the fact that he's growing. I think it's hard to get enough of the nutrients that mm-hmm. I mean, we're we're omnivores. We're supposed to have more of that. Yeah. Especially the more active that you are. So it might be hard for him to go completely vegetarian. Yeah. And he was already he was already losing weight with sports and he lost a little bit more this week. And I was like, uh, I don't know if this is, <laughs> this is the right diet for you. Maybe not. Yeah. But he was like, there's an Olympian wrestler. He's vegetarian. I'm like, yeah, but he eats like four flats of eggs. <laughs> <laughs> we can't afford that. <laughs> no, that's not going to be good. So we it made us a little more conscious and we're going to start, I'm, I'm going to make sure that our family starts to do a little less. Yeah. I think everybody should. Yeah. Maybe that should be every listener's goal this week. A little take, less meat. Yeah. Take a li- one more meal out of your, if you already do one, take two meals out that don't, don't have meat. And if you're vegetarian, give yourself a gold star. <laughs> I will say I did find some plant-based faux sausage. It was delicious. Yeah. It was super good. Yeah. And I was like... But it, that idea kind of weirds me out because I'm like, if you want to taste meat, just eat the meat. <laughs> I know. And also, like, how what chemicals made that? You know? Exactly. <laughs> um, Abby just had a, a Beyond Burger. Heard of those. At, at Burger King. And she said she really liked it. Hmm. 
So she was like, if we're in, on the road and we have to get a fast food meal or something, I now know that that's something I would like to have. Okay. She said I'll it tasted it. just like a regular Whopper, but it didn't have any meat. Interesting. Yeah. All right. Okay, everybody. I think we're ready. Yeah. So um, I have somebody who's still alive. Ooh. And who's done a lot of work and is not done. Nice. I have one that's just bonkers. <laughs> Maybe we should end with yours because it sounds like it'll be silly. Yeah, she's crazy. <laughs> okay, then. Are you ready? I'm ready. I think you actually might know this person. Okay. Do you know who Winona LaDuke is? I don't know her. No. Oh, thank God. <laughs> I know there are going to be a lot of listeners, though, that are going to go, I already know her. <laughs> but I don't think you know everything because I knew who she was, but I didn't know everything about her. And I was still shocked and surprised by how much she's done. What was her last name? LaDuke. LaDuke. Winona, Winona LaDuke. LaDuke. No. Okay. She's an environmental activist. Oh, mm. vegetarian conversation <laughs> fit in. <laughs> a writer, an economist, and a vice presidential candidate. What? <laughs> I, I just had really- the confused dog look on my face. <laughs> So Winona LaDuke was born on August 19th, 1959 in Los Angeles, California. Her parents were Betty Bernstein and Vincent LaDuke. Her name is actually um, means first daughter in the Dakota language. Oh, okay. Betty was of European Jewish ancestry and grew up in the Bronx in New York. So her mom was Jewish from New York. Her dad, Vincent, was from the Anishinaabe White Earth Reservation in Minnesota some people also know it as Ojibwe, but the actual like native name to them is, again, I'm going to try this again because I think I screwed it up, Anishinaabe. Okay. Anishinaabe. Um, so he was from Minnesota, and he's native, and she's Jewish from the Bronx. He had worked as a struggling actor in Westerns. He was all, always playing like an Indian in Westerns. Yeah. And yeah, like that's what he called himself like an extra Indian. <laughs> oh, um, he, so he was in Hollywood working sort of not often, like he had, he had a lot of roles, but like they weren't big roles. So he didn't have a lot of money. Kind of like the, the struggling acting, struggling actor storyline. Yeah, for sure. And bet, and Betty was actually a student enrolled in art school. <laughs> so they really didn't have much wow. money for them when she was young. Yeah. Uh, Vincent enrolled Winona in his tribe when she was born. So she had automatic tribal membership, but she didn't visit or live on the White Earth Reservation much until way later. Okay. Her parents separated when she was five. And from then on, she lived primarily with her mother, who moved the two of them to Ashland, Oregon. Hey. Yeah, in our territory. Where she, Betty worked as an art instructor at Southern Oregon College, which is now Southern Oregon University. And apparently now she's quite a, like, renowned artist. Wow. Okay. Winona's first foray into activism started when she was 10. Oh, whoa. (laughs) She and her mother attended a peace rally in the neighboring town of Medford, Oregon, that was um, protesting the Vietnam War. So that was her first, like, whoa. Taste of it, yeah. But she was kind of born for this. I had actually read a story that her father, Vincent LaDuke, had been a little bit of a lands rights activist when he lived on the reservation and had sort of given up that that side of his work when he moved to Hollywood. But that sort of, I think, was in her blood all Mm, along, was to be this kind of activist person. She was described by her peers and teachers as a polite and curious child, and she was very creative. She liked to spend her time learning how to sew and make crafts. Winona's mother, Betty, recalled that the transition from Los Angeles to Ashland wasn't easy for Winona because she was a very visibly brown young woman. Mm -hmm. And Betty said that Ashland was, quote, very white then. Native people just didn't exist. They'd been disappeared. Oh, geez. Yeah. I love the active verb of that. They'd been disappeared. Mm-hmm. As in, like, they didn't just disappear on their own. They didn't walk away. They'd been it purposely... was done to them. Yes. yes. Meanwhile, Winona's dad, Vincent, had reinvented himself. Oh. And as a kind of native spiritual guru and took on the name Sun Bear. Okay. Yeah. So he's just trying to make a dime. 
I, yeah, I guess. Okay. I mean, I think he really believed in what he was doing, but he was really just conning some white folks who like <laughs> native spirituality. <laughs> Which that does happen, and it still does happen, yeah. Yeah, he was very popular among white people, mostly, mm -hmm. and like most of his followers were white people, and he was quite popular in Germany. Okay. <laughs> yeah. And a lot of Native people um, eyed him with indifference and maybe even a little bit disdain or suspicion because of how he was using Native... He was teaching, like, have respect for Native spirituality and, like, all these white people are, like, totally buying into it. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, it's like he's making money off of their mm -hmm. belief system and that's really weird, you know? Yeah. Winona attended Ashland Public Schools and although she speaks of her childhood as a happy one, she did say that she faced both racism and anti-Semitism. She was like, when you grow up brown and Jewish, <laughs> it's going to be a hard That's time. A, yeah. And in, and in actually, I read this little tidbit that no one ever asked her to prom. Like She never got to go to any school dances, ever. No, no one, one ever asked to. her to go to a school yeah. dance. I can understand that. And I was like, oh, that breaks my heart. Mm-hmm. So she um, was really intelligent and actually pretty outgoing, but she didn't have very much confidence. So her t a teacher of hers said, you know what you should do? Join the debate team. Hmm. And she did. And she became a really successful debater. She actually placed third in all of the state of Oregon when she was a senior. Wow. And the Impressive. skills that she learned as a debater would become the skills that she would build upon for the whole rest of her life. So kids, if you're thinking about it, join the debate team. <laughs> <laughs> uh, in her teen years, Winona became really interested in environmental issues, particularly, especially those that were affecting native lands and communities. So even though she was living in Ashland, Oregon, not on a reservation, she was very much concerned about reservation um, issues. And was learning a lot about them on her own. And in fact, at the age of 18, Winona spent a summer in Nevada campaigning against nuclear testing and uranium mining on Navajo lands. Whoa. And this already put her on the map as an activist. Which is pretty cool. Yeah. 18. Getting it young. <laughs> this garnered her enough attention that she was actually asked to fly to Geneva, Switzerland to address the United Nations. Whoa. 18. That Yikes. She gave expert testimony about the exploitation of native lands, something that she would be called on to do many times in her life. So Winona applied to and got into Harvard. And That's impressive. <laughs> and uh, I read this interview, this article that I'll mention later that was really great. But basically, she only applied to Harvard because um, people didn't expect her to. Oh, whoa. <laughs> <laughs> I know. I'm like, it's great. Yeah. Um, at Harvard, she actually really lucked out because she found a really thriving, br vibrant, if small, uh, community of Indian activists on campus. And she joined them and started working on activism on campus. What uh, What year is this when she's in college? Um, So she was born in 1959. So it would have been Late. 77, probably. Okay. That'd be um, a fun time to be at Harvard. Yeah. Yeah. Well, yes and no. <laughs> yes and no. But an interesting time. You know? But it is the height of American Indian activism is around this time because AIM and then the um, Pine Ridge takeover, uh, the takeover at Alcatraz, all that stuff happened in the late, like the early 70s, yeah. mid 70s. Wow. That's really cool. So she would have been, I mean, like it, that it was, was the heart yeah. of it was happening. The height of it. Later that year, she, um, oh, sorry. So at Harvard, she had this strong group of Indian activists that she had um, been a part of. She was majoring in Native Economic Development. Wow. So she was specifically studying economics. Mm -hmm. She got her bachelor's degree in economics, but she was really focused on how to develop the economy on Native lands and on reservations. That's brilliant. Mm-hmm. So she graduated in 1982, and then later that year, she moves to the White Earth Reservation, which is where her father had called home, but where Winona was received as a basically a stranger mm -hmm. and seen as an outsider. And I, I can't imagine what that would feel like. Yeah, it's a sense of that you've got nowhere to belong to, you know, mm -hmm. you can't be on either side of the 
either side of the fence. Yeah, she's too native for the white people, and, and she's, she's not, not native, native enough, enough for the reservation. Yep. So she showed up with all these really big ideas and like, I'm going to come help. And and they're like, who are you? <laughs> yeah. It wasn't received very well at first. Um, she, she really um, offended and sort of upended the entrenched leadership of mm. the tribe at the time. And also she didn't, you know, she didn't speak Ojibwe and she didn't know very many people there. And she just had started out like three rows back mm-hmm. <laughs> and she was really struggling with that. She actually took a job as the principal of the high school. And while she worked, she was also enrolled in a long distance master's program through Antioch University. So yet again, a really big university. Yeah. And also she's working full time as a principal and doing this at the same time. Jesus. (laughs) See, she was at researching at the time as part of her studies, the white earth reservations subsistence economy And this work is what led directly into a showdown with the tribal, state, and federal government leadership. Whoa. So to explain what comes next, I have to briefly, and I'm going to try to succinctly try to explain what happened with reservation lands. And this is, I'm specifically talking about Ojibwe, but a lot of the same stuff happened to a lot of different native land Mm -hmm. situations. In the early 1800s, the federal government said that the reservations would be divided into land parcels. Mm Mm-hmm. So, like, they have a big chunk, little pieces. Tribal members would then be assigned to a parcel. So, like, you would have your parcel, I would have my parcel. Mm -hmm. And then you were supposed to just farm on it or something like that. But this was, like, really contrary to a lot of traditional ways for a lot of people in a lot of different tribes. You know, some of the tribes were nomadic and migratory and so just being stuck in one place was already a problem Mm -hmm. and then like oh now you get this spot over here and your cousin gets that spot over there and your aunt gets that you know what i mean Mm -hmm. so that started to create a problem too because that's not really how familial housing arrangements would necessarily work so that was another thing that was like i don't really think that works for me and some people just didn't live on their parcel or they didn't do anything with their parcel of land and so if if that that happened, like, like let's say Isai got a piece of land. He's 10. He's not going to go move into yeah. that piece of land. And that's what they would do a lot. So if they saw a piece of land that hadn't been used for anything, they would consider it abandoned. How do you just consider it abandoned? <laughs> they okay. would just consider it abandoned and then it could be taken by white people. Oh, shit. Okay. So that was one way that they were losing parcels of lands. Um, another thing they did is they, they had this whole rule about what they called mixed bloods, which Mm. is just an offensive term anyway. Mm -hmm. We're not, and people are not dogs. Yeah. (laughs) So if a person who, who owned a parcel of land was considered a mixed blood person, they could sell their parcel outside, like to somebody else. So many tribal folks were then bullied and harassed into selling their land, and some were even reclassified as mixed blood so they could be kicked out through tax foreclosure and other government loopholes. So much of this land was then taken over by logging companies on the uh, tribal, like on this, on the Jibway land. Yeah. And then the logging companies were clear cutting all of the trees and gutting the land. By the time all of this was finished, the Anishinaabe owned less than 10% of their original reservation. Whoa. And again, the reservation by itself was maybe 10% of what they had originally owned to begin with. Jeez. Yeah, so it's really bad. They've got nothing, yeah. So this is what Winona de Duke is coming in on. The tribe already has lost almost all of their land, 90% of it. They have less than 10% of their original land. So in 1977, a tribal member rejected the claim that his land was subject to foreclosure and he sued and the case landed in the Minnesota Supreme court. This brought the subject of land ownership back to the forefront and any decisions decisions that were made from that case would have effects across the state of Minnesota for every tribal owning land property. So in 1983, just after Winona has arrived at white earth, a state representative who's a real jackass <laughs> named Arlen Stangeland. Aren't they so awesome when they represent us? <laughs> well, at one at one point he's quoted as saying in a fucking newspaper, there ain't no way those Indians are getting their land back. Oh, shit. Like, he was a dick. Okay. So he proposes this thing called the white. Um, so he had, he had 
come up with this idea called the White Earth Reservation Land Settlement Act, WELSA. Okay. And he was pushing this, and he's talking to the tribal leadership, and he's like, this is what you guys should do. You should accept this. So the idea was that the government would give White Earth a set amount of money for the land that had been taken. And basically, they were supposed to take that money and go. Yeah. End of conversation. You got paid. Be happy. Kind of thing. So to many tribal members, that felt like a payoff. Yeah, absolutely. And they were like, nope. No. So they went back and they said, no, we're not doing that. Our people don't want that. We're not going to settle for that. So then the government came back with another offer, this time for $17 million. Yikes. It's a lot of money. It's a lot of money. And you can imagine that that made people go, well... (laughs) I mean, who who doesn't want to be rich, you know? Yeah. $17 million is a lot of money. Yeah. Especially, this is the early 80s. Shit. $17 million is a lot now, but 30 years ago? Yeah. Oof. So, this divided the people. Mm. The longtime tribal chairman, his name was Chip Wadina, he was absolutely 100% for the settlement. There were a group of citizens, however, who called themselves the Anishinaabeg Aking. They were otherwise known as the People's Land. They were against the settlement. Mm-hmm. Winona came up with a third option. Okay. She's so smart. <laughs> Her plan was, let's accept the offer, put the money in an interest-earning account, take the interest from the settlement, and buy back the reservation land parcel by parcel. Ooh. That is clever. Yeah, you get both. You get both. Because <laughs> <laughs> she was saying all you'd have to do is use the interest from that money to be able to buy the land. Yeah. You wouldn't ever even have to touch the $17 million. You just use, you could, you know, my parents always used to say that about like, oh, you win the lottery, put that in an account, live off the interest. You know, you don't have to touch the money. Yeah. And that's basically what her plan was. If we do this, and again, she's an economist with a degree from Harvard. She knows what she's talking about. (laughs) She she's like, we can buy our land back and have the money. Yeah. So And also not use any of our money at all to buy this back. It's like win win. mm -hmm. Yeah. So Wadina, who is the tribal chairman and other leadership were one hundred percent against her plan. Why? Hmm. Because she's an outsider, okay, according to them. And it also seemed like, as like sort of reading between the lines on a lot of things, that the tribal leadership was really firmly rooted in the Western patriarchal paradigm, and they didn't see any irony in that. Wow. <laughs> uh, so, but because they were for the settlement and Winona was working on this other thing, it ended up working out. The settlement passed, and Winona did exactly what she set out to do. She went to that other group, the citizens group I told you about earlier, the mm-hmm. Anishinaabe Anking, and she said, let's partner, and we're going to use this money. So she founded what was called the White Earth Land Recovery Project. She founded it with proceeds that she'd gotten from a human rights award she got from Reebok. Oh, <laughs> Whoa. <laughs> So she began buying back back land bit by bit. The land was then held in a con- so she would buy back the land, then the land would be held in a conservation trust that would eventually be given back to the tribe. And I don't have any numbers for as of 2019, but by the year 2000 they had purchased 1200 acres back. Wow, it's a lot. It's something, you know. Yeah. Around this time, in 1985, Winona also founded the Indigenous Women's Network, designed to be a coalition of women who used Indigenous values to engage in activism. The nonprofit has since ended. It, I couldn't find that it, the domain and everything was gone, so I okay. think they're done done. But it did go on until like somewhere around 2009 at least. Wow. And it flourished for many years, and it helped coordinate Indigenous women across the country, and they produced the only magazine that was for and by Indigenous women. Wow, that's really cool. That's really cool. In 1989, Winona finished her master's degree. So all of this is still happening. She's She's still still working on a master's degree. (laughs) She finished her master's degree in rural development and took off for for a place in Ontario, Canada called Moose Factory, where they were 
there was this big hydroelectric company that wanted to build a dam on the land. Mm. And Winona was determined to stop it. Mm -hmm. So she was working on this campaign when she met a man named Randy Randy Kapasheset. He was a Cree man who was also working to stop this development. And they had a chemistry. (laughs) (laughs) Oh my God, you want to save the world too? Yes. (laughs) (laughs) Because it's hot. (laughs) Conservationism is hot. (laughs) So they fell in love. they They got married and they ended up having two children together. Awesome. They were successful in stopping the dam's construction, but their marriage didn't last. Oh. And they ended up divorcing after a few years together. So now we're going to, we were in the late 80s. Now we're in the early 90s, 1993. Okay. I can't believe I didn't know about this. <laughs> I feel like I have to get my lesbian card revoked. <laughs> oh, no. Winona teamed up with the Indigo Girls. <laughs> what? To create a nonprofit called Honor the Earth. And it was a native led environmental nonprofit. I have you heard of this? No. Before? Did you even know that the Indigo Girls were doing that? No. I, I don't know. What it's Winona LaDuke and the two the two singers of the Indigo Girls. Okay. And this is what it says on their website that their whole thing is about. Our mission is to create awareness and support for native environmental issues and to develop needed financial and political resources for the survival of sustainable native communities. Honor the Earth works to A, raise public awareness, and B, raise and direct funds to grassroots Native environmental groups. We are the only Native organization that provides both financial support and organizing support to Native environmental initiatives. Wow. Cool beans. Very, yeah. Winona also decided to expand the duties and the goals of the White Earth Land Recovery Project. I don't, they had kept putting the acronym in there and I was like, world, I don't know how to say it. <laughs> So I was like, we're just going to go with the whole name. We're just going with this. In addition to buying up those parcels of land, Winona also set out to bring back traditional uses of the land. And that included bringing back the process of wild rice harvesting. That's really neat. That was my next question. I was like, okay, they're getting the land, but what are they doing with it? She had plans. Nice. Always with the plans. <laughs> so the I actually watched a video of the rice harvesting and I was like, this is the coolest shit I've ever seen. So they would they would get out in like traditional canoes and go on the like the wild rice grows in these like really tall stalks of grass. And so you go out in the canoe on the water and you take these poles and you brush the rice into the canoe and you just fill up the canoe with rice. That's really neat. It was so cool. And it's done every August. So I I thought that was just really neat. Mhm. And there was, I wanted to, there was a radio clip of her on NPR 10 or 15 years ago talking about this. And it was really cool, but it didn't quite work with the sound that we wanted. So uh, White Earth Land Recovery Project. So they sell the rice that they harvest, but they also sell plum jewelry that they also, or uh, plum, not plum jewelry, plum jelly. <laughs> that would have been real weird. Plum jelly? <laughs> you, Plum jelly, uh, loose leaf tea, maple syrup, hominy. Mm, I love hominy. Yeah. You make them good pozole. <laughs> and they also sell handmade crafts like beaded jewelry and birch bark frames and painted mugs. So all kinds of stuff that you can buy online or you can go into retail stores near there and buy it. Wow. Oh. Um, Winona then also started working with this group that had been around for a long time called Women of All Red Nations. And they were really working on, originally they had worked on that uranium mining thing that I told you about when she was like 18. Yeah. She went and worked on that campaign. So this time she decided she had quite a status, right? Mm -hmm. So she started lending her voice to the issue that they were really trying to get a lot of kind of reparations for, which was the forced sterilization of Native American women. Oh, yeah. That happened really a lot during the 60s and 70s. Mm-hmm. And this I this number I got from something that Winona had said. She said an estimated 25% of Native women of childbearing age were sterilized sometime before 1976. Jeez. That's crazy. Yeah. So Winona used her status to try to help highlight this issue and help them get uh, movement forward on it. 
1995, Winona was named one of America's 50 most promising leaders under the age of 40 by Time magazine. Wow. And in 1996, she was the she shared the Ms. Women of the Year with the Indigo Girls. <laughs> and these honors garnered her a lot of attention, making her one of the most prominent women in America. How did I not know this woman? I knew of her, but I didn't know any like none of this stuff. No. I knew I knew I knew she worked in Native Lands and that's it. That's all I knew. It made sense then that in 1996, the Green Party called Winona and asked her to be to be the vice presidential candidate for their ticket. Oh, OK. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so she declined, though. She was like, no, I'm not into that. <laughs> like, I'm, I'm, I got my I got a little I got a little business going on here. I yeah, got a lot of things I'm, I'm doing. <laughs> I'm a little busy. <laughs> but then Ralph Nader himself called her. Oh, and he had been chosen to be the Green Party's candidate. And he personally called and asked Winona to be his running mate. And she was like, well, when Ralph Nader calls you, you have to say yes. <laughs> <laughs> so the first time around in 1996, the party didn't garner much attention or financial gain or anything like that. Like, it was kind of small beans. Yeah. But in uh, 2000, <laughs> it was a different story. How old were you in 2000? In 2000, I was 15. Yes. Yeah, the 2000 election, which 14, would have happened 15. 2000, 2001. Okay. Yeah, you were 15? 15. 14? 14, 15, yeah. Yeah, I was, that would have been my senior year. And I, so I was 16 when the election happened. Do you remember what happened at the 2000 election? Remind me. That was Bush v. Gore. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Florida, hanging chads, recounts. Oh, when the world was hanging on a chad. Yes. Hanging on a chad. <laughs> so the Green Party <laughs> had was like, a, hey. a lot of momentum that year, raised a ton of money, um, like really had made a mark. And they got on the ballot on like 45 states. Wow. And right now, now we have Ralph Nader and Winona LaDuke on TV talking about what they're doing. So the Democratic Party was like, no. <laughs> <laughs> because they knew that the Green Party could split the left vote. Yeah. And splitting absolutely. the left vote would cost the presidency, right? So when Gore lost. <laughs> <laughs> and he lost. I, and did he really, though? Did he? No. <laughs> uh, the courts decided he did. So he lost, you know, whatever. We're still sore about that one. A lot of people felt like it was Ralph Nader and Wynuna the Duke's fault because they were the Green Party <sighs> ticket. Okay. So when asked about this years later by Portland's Willamette Weekly, Wynuna said this. Okay. She's spicy. <laughs> I refuse to take responsibility for the Bush administration being in office. We worked hard for our votes. The Americans who didn't vote should take some responsibility, being the largest percentage of the population. The disenfranchised voters who were kicked off the rolls by the Republicans in Florida outnumber the number of people who voted for the Green Party. The Democrats had far more money, and I refuse to take responsibility. Wow. True. She ain't wrong. No, she's not wrong at all. There's no lie in that. No. So sometime prior to running for the position of vice president, Winona met Kevin Gasco, who would become her partner and is to this day still her partner. The two had a child in 1999. So while she was running for office, Winona was breastfeeding. Oh my gosh. So she would have her infant with her and she'd be like, take out the boob, <laughs> put the baby on in front of the reporters and shit. And they would be like, uh, ah. mm, uh, mm. <laughs> and she, women's bodies scare me. And this reporter, I was, I was like this article that I was reading about that happened. It was like six or seven years later was like, people were like, what is happening? <laughs> and, you know, I think a reporter had asked her like, is this your way of, is this another way of protesting? And she was like, is it a protest to you? <laughs> I mean, whoa. whoa, I would wiggle in my chair. <laughs> yeah, I'm pretty sure that every man in the whole room wiggled a little. <laughs> so she she had no qualms about that stuff. So not one to slow down. <laughs> like she's done At all this stuff. <laughs> Winona has spent every waking moment since her early, her early days as an activist showing up for environmental causes and being a prolific writer. Oh, 
She served as the director for the White Earth Land Recovery Project for 25 years, working to purchase back tribal land and develop the tribe's independent economic stability. She also worked as the program director for the Seventh Generation Fund, which is an organization that advocates on behalf of Native Americans and the environment. In 2007, she was inducted into the National Women's Hall of Fame and sat on the board of Greenpeace. Oh, wow. Around 2015, she began farming hemp, because why not? Because why not? Because why not do another thing? (laughs) And she is now a pretty big advocate for cannabis farming and harvesting, especially on native lands. Mm -hmm. She grows both industrial fiber hemp and CBD. She also became interested in coffee, like really big interested in coffee, like loves coffee a lot. Mm -hmm. And so she started working with, with, in the article, this is Mexican peasants, and I was like, I don't like that. No. I don't like that. (laughs) I think they meant something different. I'm hoping. (laughs) But in any case, with Mexican growers, and I think what they were trying to say is that it's like small time farmers Mm. that would have normally been working for like massive corporations that were like working them to the bone kind of situation. Yeah, taking advantage as well. Yeah. And so I think there's a co-op of small town, like small time growers that are harvesting the beans for her. Mm-hmm. So then they send the beans up to her and she roasts them and then sells them on that native harvest website. Wow. And her coffee company is called Round Lake Coffee Roasters. She also started her own press. Nice. Literary press. In 2016, when Washington state electors were casting their votes for the presidential election, there was one lone elector who bucked the Democratic Party. Instead of voting for Hillary Clinton, Robert, Set- I think it's Satyakam Jr., wrote in Faith Spotted Eagle for president. She was a Yakima Nation woman. And Winona LaDuke for vice president, making Winona the first Native American woman to win an electoral vote for vice president. And wow. Faith, the first Native woman to win one for president. <laughs> That's really cool. <laughs> it is really cool. So she's been at the forefront of all of the major pipeline protests as well, mm. including the 2016 No Dapple movement at Standing Rock. She also worked on the campaigns against the Keystone and Enbridge pipelines as well. And she was just this weekend like putting out statements and shit about the fact that everything that the Native folks who are protesting the No Dapple pipeline have said came true when there was like thousands and thousands of gallons of oil spilled on North Dakota's land. Mm -hmm. To this day, she is still the director of the honor the earth fund. That's the company or the organization she started with the Indigo girls. Winona LaDuke has written seven books. Jesus. I'm trying to write one. Writing takes so much time. So much time. So much time. And all of your lifeblood. Yeah. So one of those books was a novel. The rest of them have been um, environmental stuff, mostly. Mm-hmm. She's also co-authored like 20 books. Her writing on indigenous environmental issues can be found all over the internet and elsewhere. Winona still travels the U.S. and beyond every year, speaking at universities and elsewhere to promote issues of indigenous rights, land rights, and more. In fact, just last week, She was at the University of Nevada, Reno, speaking on indigenous economics. Wow. (laughs) So there was one last thing I wanted to leave with, which is um, I wanted to get some vocal quotes of her. She is in a lot of stuff. Like, there have been documentaries made about her. She's on Democracy Now! She's all over the radio. Like, it doesn't take much to find her. But Mm -hmm. I wanted to just include this thing about redemption, which I really like her thoughts. She's talking about Mahatma Gandhi And she's talking about how the loss of land um, has never offered the opportunity. Like There have been opportunities for white people to make amends and have not been Mm. done. Yeah. Sometimes I say, what would Nelson do? You know, talking about Mandela. What would Mandela do? I mean, you look at the situation of, you know, South Africa with the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. You look at, uh, you know, the president of Liberia, the first woman president of an African country. Um, Ellen Johnson, she said, I believe in redemption. There's two sides. One side is the apology in which the perpetrator says, what I did was wrong and I would like to make amends to you. That has not happened. (laughs) And the other side is the offer of redemption. Because as Mandela said, is that 
the perpetrator also carries this weight of the crime and becomes his own victim in that dynamic of having done something egregious. And so in that guilt, the perpetrator is not healthy either. So the process of apology and redemption or forgiveness, yeah, is a mutual healing process. Wow, she's amazing. She really is. And super powerful and has been doing this shit since she was 10. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, she was born in 1959. Yeah. It's 2019. She's younger, my, she's younger than my parents. How old does that make her now? 59 to 2019. I wish I could do math faster. So... F- 60? 60 maybe, yeah, 61? Yeah, I think she's, yeah, she'll, yeah. she's been six, she turned 60 this year. And she's still... She's still at it. And I know that um, in one of the articles I read, oh, I want to talk about my sources, actually. So I did use Wikipedia for a couple of things. And the Oregon Encyclopedia, which had great stuff on her early life that a lot of other places didn't have. I really loved this article I read that was archived online you can't just get to it. You have to go through the Wayback Machine. And it was called The Party Crasher by Peter Ritter. And it was in City Pages, which I think might be a Minnesota publication. I used the actual websites for her organizations like Honor the Earth and mm-hmm. the White Earth Recovery Project and her own website. And I used that archived article from Willamette Weekly where she <laughs> said the quote about the 2000 <laughs> election. There was a really great little audio piece on NPR about the harvesting of the rice, which was cool. And I used the National Women's Hall of Fame, humansandnature.org, and Montana Public Radio. Very cool. One of the articles that I read, the big one on City Pages, the one by Peter Ritter, he talked about, because at the time she's nursing, Mm -hmm. that's her third child, because she had two with her first husband, and then a, a third child with her other partner. And then she was also raising two or three other kids at the time. Um, I think two were like a niece or nephew or something. Okay. Two were nieces and nephews. And then one was just a random kid that didn't have parents, I guess. Wow. And now she's a grandmother. Oh, wow. (laughs) Yeah. I mean, she just seems also like a really warm person. Mm -hmm. And I thought that was really cool. I didn't want to go too much into family stuff because we've talked about this a lot on the podcast that it sucks that women often don't get just their achievements talked about. They also have their personal lives Mm -hmm. talked about in more detail than men often do. Oh, yeah. And honestly, it didn't. I mean, there was so much. to. I literally this took me way longer than normal because I, I just kept reading and reading and reading and reading. Kept finding stuff and I was her. like, I can't include every damn thing I've read about her, but I wish I could. Yeah. And like, I then started falling into the rabbit hole of her own writing. Like I was reading all of her oh, articles no. and I was like, I'm never going to get done with this. <laughs> so just know if you're super interested in my Nona, you just Google her and you'll find millions of results. And half of them are her own that she's written. And she's totally worth reading because her writing is really powerful and great. That is awesome. No, thank you for bringing her to light. Like, honestly, I didn't know. I didn't know her. Yay, and she's still alive. Yeah, and now I'm doing great things. <laughs> so tell me about your bonkers person. <laughs> this uh, this story just kind of tickled me because it's so scandalous. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. I just I wanted to scandalo. do Yes, I just wanted to do something kind of fun. Um, so my lady today is Julie de Aubigny. AKA known as La Maupin. No, I have no idea. <laughs> she is an opera singer and one of the greatest swordswomen of her time. Sw- sw- swordswomen. <laughs> We're so good at this. We're so good. <laughs> so, uh, Julie was born around 1673. Uh, she was the daughter of a secretary to one of King Louis XIV's greatest nobles, Count de Armagnac, 
He was the master of the horses. Imagine uh-huh. that title. I want that title. <laughs> master what do you do, of the, master no, I don't of the horses? Actually, because I don't like horses. <laughs> That's right. I have a healthy she respect has a for them. Healthy fear of horses. <laughs> respect. <laughs> they don't. You don't need them to know they're you're afraid that they might attack. <laughs> oh, I'm going to take you horseback riding someday. No, you're not. It's so, not happening. <laughs> she grew up and lived in the riding school at the Tuileries Palace in Paris. Then moved with the court to Versailles in 1682. Her mother had left her father and was completely out of the picture. She abandoned the family. Oh. Um, yeah. So just mama was gone. Uh, most of her youth was spent in the great stables watching her father, who was an accomplished swordsman and he was an accomplished writer. As her father trained the royal court pages, he taught Julie right alongside them. Her father was like riddled with vices. He drank. He gambled extensively. Uh, he got into fights. Um, he had a multiple string of affairs with women, and he was he was not a very good uh, role model for for Julie. Mm. So she um, excelled immediately at fencing at an early age. Uh, she was a bit of a troublemaker though, and she started uh, messing around with her father's students. Oh, yes. Oh, and her, that's not what I expected. Her father would get really pissed off and he would challenge the boys to duels and be like, get the fuck away from my daughter. <laughs> and so Julie decided to pick a man that her father couldn't really get in a fight with. She started to have an affair with his boss. Oh, uh, yeah. Oh, the noble de Armagnac. OK, 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 OK. Let's let's pause the train for a second. <laughs> How old is she? Julia's 14 at this time. Yeah, I don't think that boss, I don't think she's having an affair with him. I think that guy is <laughs> having an affair with a 14-year-old girl. And I don't know if I call it an affair so much as rape. <laughs> True story. <laughs> 14-year-olds, not yeah. exactly with it. No. So her father is, of course, immediately upset with this. Uh, he doesn't want her to be found in a family way. He doesn't want her to be part of a scandal. So he's like, you're getting married. <laughs> so he finds her a husband. Wait, that's not the dude? That's not the dude. Okay. Uh, finds her a young man. He's very calm. He's very timid. He's very shy. His father's like, if you want, you will marry my daughter. It's an arranged marriage. Um, you'll get a job. Like you guys will be taken care of. And the the man accepts. They're married. Julie does not want to be a wife. She doesn't want to stay. Um, she's kind of just tired of her situation there with her father and what's going on between. And she the wants two to of sleep them. around. Apparently, and she wants to. Go away. Well, because like you, you said like her, her dad was like, okay, you're going to get married. Because like basically she wouldn't yeah. be able to calm it down. Yeah. Okay. So Julie runs away. Um, she ends up running away with a young fencing master called Saran. Saran and Julie had no money and they quickly found themselves in a really tough spot. Uh, so they earned a little bit of money from fencing demonstrations at fairs and at taverns. Um, at one such demonstration, a man refused to believe that Julie was really a woman uh, <laughs> because she was far too good. And she actually excelled her partner like she put him in the dust. So he was heckling her from the audience. And so Julie decides to turn around and she rips open her shirt and shows him her breasts. Oh, oh OK. <laughs> well, that's and one way to take and care of And the man of fell silent. And Julie, with a smirk on her face, just puts her shirt back back together. <laughs> Oh my, she is a scandal. <laughs> so to earn more money, she begins training and singing with the Marseille, was it Marseille? Yeah, Marseille. Marseille Opera Company, which was owned by She Pierre. just starts, she, like, she that tra- is she trained in opera? <laughs> so she starts training and she starts working with the owner, Pierre Gaultier. But how does she get, she just walks she in and is like, I'm going to sing opera now. <laughs> what? Yeah. So her early appearances on stage were actually really well received. Um, she began performing under her married name, which was the Mademoiselle Maupin. And that's how she became known as the La Maupin. She started to get uh, bored with Saran. She was like, you're not really doing it for me anymore. Okay. <laughs> so she dumps him. She picks up a relationship with uh, a local merchant's daughter. Oh, yes. Oh, I like this turn of events. <laughs> um, we do not know the girl's name, and she falls in love with this woman, or this girl, I should say. The girl's family freaks out and is like, uh, you're not going to be a lesbian. So <laughs> they send her to go live in a convent in Avignon. I'm so sorry, girl. Yeah. Julie decides to follow her. 
Oh. And she enters the convent herself and continues the affair while they're both nuns. Oh, that's juicy. <laughs> that's great. Isn't that great? <laughs> oh, that's great. That's that's like the premise of a great novel. Right? Thank you that for that. That itself could be a book. <laughs> so uh, Julie hatches a plan. On the night after one of the elderly nuns passes away, she steals the body and places it in her girlfriend's cell, and she sets the convent on fire to make it look like her girlfriend died in the fire and they can run away together. But did anybody else die in the fire? I did not find anything that said anybody else died. But she runs away with her girlfriend. All right, then. Yes. <laughs> um, the plan, I mean, that's one way to get away with it. Yeah. The plan doesn't really work. So they're on the run for three months, and Julie is found guilty and sentenced to death in absentia, which means you don't have to be present for the yeah. trial, uh, by the parliament in Provence for her crime. And the judge sentences her under Monsieur de Maupin because he doesn't really want to, like he can't fathom that a woman would do this. Oh, he thinks how that, bizarre. Yeah, he thinks that, could this possibly be a woman who stole a body and ran away with a girl? <laughs> And burn a nunnery down. Like <laughs> he's kind of like he just he can't can't fathom it. Yeah, the girl eventually is like, I'm out. <laughs> and she this goes is a lot of drama. It is. She goes back to her family, and Julie continues to wander throughout the countryside. She's still sword demonstrating. She's earning a living, and at this time, so many men are challenging her ability. She starts she starts dueling. Oh, for for money. For I'm money. Sure. She's like, you know what? Shut the fuck up. And she is like whooping people one after the other after the other. And at this time, too, she um, I, I should have mentioned this before at a younger age. And even now, she really experimented with cross dressing. Oh, OK. So she dressed as a man, but she still kind of carried herself as a woman. So she kind of played both sides. Mm -hmm. um, maybe, maybe, maybe non-binary, <laughs> maybe non-binary. Exactly. And so, yeah, she begins dueling and she's like kicking ass. She takes up a new lover, a singer named Gabrielle Vincent Thevenard. Together, they return to Paris and she uh, visits her old lover, the uh, the Armiac. And but, she's like, uh, there are so many now. You have to go. OK, he was the one she her father's boss, the boss. Okay. Yes, the noble. And she's like, hey, remember me? She convinces him to use his position and authority to arrange a pardon for her for her crime that she did. <laughs> he agrees. Okay. Yeah, so she's pardoned. So while she's in Paris, Gabriel auditions for an opera company and he's hired. He gets Julie an audition and she gets a part and becomes part of one of Paris's greatest musical companies. And she's about 17 at this time. Oh my God, I thought she was in her 20s at least no, by now. No, she's 17. This has all happened in three years? Yeah. Wow. And since she's been fully pardoned by her crime from her crimes, she goes on to become fairly popular and famous as an opera singer. She was And part nobody's of like, hey, aren't you that girl who burned down a nunnery? <laughs> <laughs> it's opera. They're dramatic. <laughs> yeah, I guess. So she's part of major productions from about 1690 to 1694. She had um Quite a unique voice. She was one of the only contraltos to appear on the stage at the time. So I was like, what's a contralto? I don't mm. know. I guess it's a very low uh, baritone uh Yeah, it's singer. basically a baritone for women. For women, yeah. Yeah, I did it. I was a contralto. And so I like looked it up and immediately got like dozens of pictures of Annie Lennox. And I'm like, okay, this girl's Annie Lennox in my head now. <laughs> <laughs> that makes her really sexy. <laughs> So she's living it up. She's partying with her opera crowd people. She's gambling. She's drinking. She's still dueling. She has yet to be beaten, by the way. Oh, I okay. I really went like nobody beat her. Well, that's good. Oh, I mean, no. oh, oh, you mean nobody has? She has not bested her duel. in yes. a duel. <laughs> <laughs> um, and at the time, dueling has become. It's been declared illegal. Oh. Because it's getting out of hand. Because people are dying. People are dying. <laughs> They're <laughs> like, this is a safety concern. <laughs> um, that doesn't stop her. She doesn't stop dueling. Uh, she continues to pick fights with men who rubbed her the wrong way. 
there was a man that was part of her opera company that was um, bothering the women, like some of the singers, and he was being like very chauvinistic. And so she challenges him to a duel. She kicks his ass and she steals his watch and his snuff box. So then later he's telling the other men that he got mugged. And that he was beaten up by a man. And she comes <laughs> over and throws his shit at his feet and was like, no, it was me. <laughs> In front of the other men. In front of the other men. <laughs> Classic. So one night she is invited to an official court ball. She's dressed in men's clothes. Um, a lot of people are like, she's eccentric, but they're kind of talking about her. Mm. And there's a girl there that catches her eye and mm. it's catching all of the guy's eyes. And so she's like, I'm going to get her. <laughs> so she starts dancing with the girl and she openly kisses the girl on the dance floor, which is gasp, you know? Yeah. It's big. No, no. She's at an official court ball. She's yeah. like, not just at an opera party. So people are just, the men are mad. Women are scandalized. It's a scandal. <laughs> So she actually gets challenged to a duel by three men at the ball. She takes them outside and she actually fights all of them at the same time and uh, she beats them all. At the same time? Yeah. She okay. had. She's, she's magic. She had openly broken the law, though. Yeah. In front of all of these court people. <laughs> and so she has to flee to Brussels, uh, cutting her opera career in Paris a little short. Yeah, you think? Yeah. Okay, well, now how old are we now? Are we 18 she's yet? She's probably like 18, 19. <sighs> My yeah. goodness. So I could tell you she's bonkers. <laughs> While in Brussels, she takes on a new stage over there, and then she takes on a new lover. And he is the elector of Bavaria. So Does she that mean? keeps like, he's like a high appointed official. Oh. She keeps like hooking up with officials, I think because it helps her get away with her shit. Yeah, but how does she get, I mean, she must come across as like, I don't know, something like high up. Yeah. Maybe enamoring. I don't know. Yeah. Uh, he gets a little freaked out by her, though. He's like, you're a little too much. <laughs> <laughs> and while she's on stage doing a performance and he's there, um, he's kind of starting to look at other women. She, in her performance, she actually stabs herself in the shoulder with a dagger for real. She's supposed <sighs> to do it like faking it in the performance she does it for real to get his attention Ooh, she and, crazy yeah and he actually says i'm out and he gives her <laughs> yeah uh-huh that's he, the right answer <laughs> he offers her forty thousand francs to leave him alone oh my god yeah and she throws the money at him she says no i don't need this oh well maybe she should take it and go because this is and also seek treatment <laughs> So she fa she takes off. She runs off to Madrid. And like this is the thing. She does not stay in one place very long. She ends up, she needs a job. She's a maid for a little while to the Countess Marino. She resented this lady. She didn't like working for this lady. And I guess one night when she was helping her get ready for a ball, she <laughs> tied radishes to the back of her hair so that the lady wouldn't be able to see, but everyone else saw it and was making fun of her. So the oh my God. And then she just quit her job and left like after she set that lady with radishes in her hair you can't put radishes in someone's <laughs> hair uh, so she's on the way back to Paris somehow she ends up getting pardoned again for the duel that she did at the ball she gets pardoned by the king's brother because he actually finds it quite impressive that this woman can best anybody out there with the sword and hmm. she's super like the way they described her sword fighting she's fierce and she's super just impressive and dominating and so people are just like holy shit she's amazing like you can't put this girl in jail and these are fencing duels right like yes. the ones with the pointed little swords yes so there's some how, real strategy that you have to do with that kind of fighting too yeah for sure how do they who, how do they declare the winner? Is it like, does somebody get stabbed? I think, well, typically like somebody can die, but I think too, like if you knock the opponent's sword out of their hand mm. and you have them bested, like you've got the sword to their throat and you can kill them at yeah. will, but you don't. There's, so she there's doesn't kill that. people when she wins She's these. killed a few. <laughs> oh, she's, she's a murderer. Okay. Okay, cool. 
Just so we're clear on that. I was like, is she killing all of these people she's winning against? <laughs> is that how she wins? She's just like, slice, slice. So even though she's been pardoned, she's like got a second chance. She's been pardoned twice, by the way. Yeah. She still keeps on fighting. She keeps on gambling. She keeps on brawling. She's seducing men and women alike. Um, until 1703, she meets this wo- woman, uh, Madame La Marquise de Florensac. She meets this woman and she's one of the most famous, wealthy, and well-connected women in France. Hmm. She falls in love with her. They fall in love with each other. They lived happily together for two years until the madame gets a fever and she dies. And so no. La Montpen was like finally happy. She was like ready to calm down and settle down. And so after losing her lover, she is devastated. She ends up um, kind of going into, what do you call it where you recluse yourself? Like, become, well, I mean, you can become a recluse or like she isolates herself. No, she just, she isolated herself and she ends up dying at the age of 33. Whoa, that's so young. She was very, very young. So she was just a recluse from the rest of her life? She, I think after her girlfriend died, she only lasted about another three years. And I think it was probably due to her lifestyle too. She was a heavy drinker, heavy partier, just, and then Mm. pulling away and just basically, I feel like just dying of a broken heart. Yeah. And she is still hailed in France as an irresistible force of nature. Her life and her escapades have inspired numerous works of art. Um, There's a novel that was written about her titled Mademoiselle de Maupin. There was a French TV series that ran for a few years. There's a musical about her. There's multiple operas about her and more. I got a lot of my information from this woman named Kelly Gardiner. She spent four to five years researching uh, La Maupin's life, and she wrote a novel called Goddess, The Real Life of Julie d'Aubigny. I also got um, some information. from. So it wasn't a novel. It was a biography. It was. Well, it was a. I don't know. Was it? It was a book. I would say probably a biography. Yes. Okay. Because because the title said the real life, so that's why I was like, wait, that's not a novel then. <laughs> and uh, I got information from Bygone Badass Broads by Mackenzie Lee. Uh, there is a Forgotten Princesses about her. Which oh, that's I cool. Love I we that love one. that place. And also, the Boston Lyric Opera has um, a piece written about her called Dissenters and Rebels, and I got some from Wikipedia. I just really liked that this girl was just burning it really really hard and fast i don't wild. know she was a wild. wild yeah wild child wild child she did her own thing she took no prisoners that's a fun story i'd like to see a movie out of that one yes <laughs> that would be great right i love seeing your face too when i say certain things you're like oh and you like touch your neck <laughs> <laughs> like i have literal pearls to clutch <laughs> clutches pearls <laughs> well that was a fun little day mm-hmm. i hope everybody enjoyed our stories I hope you're continuing to enjoy the stories. Make sure you tell your friends to subscribe and listen. We are also on social media. We always post photos of the people that we talk about. And I'd love for you guys to keep following us and checking us out on there. And again, tell your friends. Tell your friends. Please. We'd like to thank our editor, Lucas McIntyre. Thank you, Lucas. And also to Jennifer Finch of L7 for our theme music. All right. Have a great one, everybody. Thank you so much, guys. Radical honesty. Hmm. Sounds like a new band. (laughs) <laughs> should be our band for radical honesty and then we just have therapy <laughs> sessions afterwards <laughs> it's really sad ukulele music <laughs> oh. what do you guys do it's really sad queer ukulele music <laughs> we talk about our feelings <laughs> we hug in silence for five minutes <laughs> oh god it's like my worst fucking nightmare i don't want to hug anybody let alone five for minutes, five minutes. <laughs>